Linda and I are going to talk about sensory activities for calming. Now, we have seven senses, five of which you'll be very familiar with. These are touch, hearing, <laughs> taste, <laughs> smell, and vision. Okay. It's nice she's very near me. I feel safe there. Um, there are two other hidden senses. This is vestibular, which is your sense of balance. So if I was to knock, she'll fall over. The other one is proprioception. Now, what I'd like to do to demonstrate this is, if you close your eyes, I want you to think about where your arms and legs are now. Your joints and muscles are sending information to your brain that tells you where your arms and legs without looking. It's your sense of position, where you are in space. That's proprioception. Okay. We're bombarded by sensory information all the time. We have to decide to attend to that information or ignore it. That decision will depend on, really, how your day goes, how you manage your day. What we want to try and do is stay within what we call a zone, just to make it straightforward. If we think of ourselves working with this zone, this is the zone we're able to cope with what arises in our day. Now, a typical day, for me, these are some typical things that I might do every day that help me, they're strategies that help me manage my day more effectively. And I'm sure these ones you've got in common with me. In the morning, I have a shower to wake myself up with hopefully cool water and maybe a good scrubbing brush to really wake me up. Then mid-morning, I probably need a drink, a cup of coffee, maybe, and something chewy to eat, out of choice, because then I'm using my big muscles in my mouth, and that helps me focus and attend. Then I'm going to have my lunch. And mid-afternoon, I probably need another drink and a snack. By that time, it's often resorted to a biscuit. Yes, or something crunchy if I'm behaving. Then after that, that should help me get through the day to the point I go home, sort out the children, get the dinner, all those demands the family give us. And then last of all, I'm going to lie on the sofa, read a book or probably watch TV to try and get myself in the zone where I can sleep that night. But most importantly in those day, the day, the thing I haven't mentioned is my movement breaks. Now, I cannot sit for longer than an hour. It really is difficult to sit for more than an hour, and I need to move. And what I will do is I might fidget a bit, I might change my position, go for a walk. <laughs> All these things help me focus during the day and help me to keep within the zone. Without those things, I am quite difficult, really. <laughs> okay. okay. So, if we go out of the zone, that's a very normal pattern to find times when we're out of our zone. Either we become more alert, more agitated, or we become a bit dulled to our sensations. That's very normal. But most of us can regulate that, that, that pattern of behavior so that we remain in the zone most of the time. Times I might be out of the zone when I'm at work, I'm trying to write a report and it's rather long and it's taking quite a long time to do. I, someone might be talking or have a radio on and it might just be too loud for me and I can't attend to what I need to attend to. And that 
is irritating, really. So I'm finding I'm moving out of this zone. I'm getting rather annoyed about this because I have to get this report done by the end of the day. And when you're writing reports, I can tell you the end of the day comes very quickly. So what I need to do is try and deal with that problem. My strategies for dealing that, with that is I could ask the person to turn the radio off or speak quieter. But actually, I want to try and get on with my colleagues at work and not annoy them too much. So maybe I wouldn't do that, first of all. Maybe I might see if there was another place I could work. If that's not possible, I might put headphones in so I can cut out that noise and concentrate on what I need to do. So in that way, I can regulate my behavior. Now, for children with autism, that's not so easy because they naturally seem to work in either an over-aroused sensation state where they're alert to fight or flight. You know, they're ready at the slightest sound to run, to make their escape, um, to hide, to hit out. That might be the response that we're getting. Or they're in this other, the lower zone, where they're actually switched off, they're dull to their environment and don't actually pick up on the sensory information around them. Either way, if you work in those two zones mostly, the world is not such a nice place to be. It's really, really difficult to work and manage your day if all you can hear around you is all the sounds. The taste you get is too, too much for you to cope with. Um, you, vis visually, you're disturbed by the lights in that room. How are you going to be able to attend and engage, which is what we'd like the children to do? Okay. So, we're here to talk about the strategies you might be able to use to help our children get to that stage that they remain in the zone for much more of their day. Okay. And the strategies. So, we have some examples of isometrics. Now, isometrics are probably something, I've done quite a lot of these just now without really thinking about it because when you're nervous, you do more of this sort of activity. Okay, so, but these are things that you can use with your children every day. In fact, you want these things to be part of their day. It's got to be an integral part of what happens within a day. Otherwise, it's not effective. Okay. But we need to watch our children and know the times they might need it. We don't do it, we try not to do it when they need it. We try to do it before they need it. We try and read what is likely to happen. So these things are in place, so we keep our children in that zone. They're regulated enough that we can get them back into the zone more easily. Linda's going to show us some here. So, putting our hands above the head, these all rely on deep pressure, which we know is calming. The receptors in our muscle groups um, and our joints send the information to your brain about calming yourself. So here, um, Linda's upper body, she's pushing up, she's igniting those receptors and also across her back. Then if Linda puts her hands on her head and pushes down, this also is doing the same thing. I see a lot of children who do this. There are many other activities you can do that will help your children, um, which we can show you later. Um, and you can do press-ups on chairs, pushing your hands together, that's lovely, pushing your hands apart, pushing down, that's it, or li lifting your shoulders up. We can use exercise balls to help the children too, being squished with an exercise ball, which we can show you later if you're interested in seeing that. Take your children to the playground. Use the seesaws. 
Use the slides. Use balance activities. These are really calming things to do. Use tug of war. That type of activity where you're getting push pull. Those things are really helpful. These are the activities. If you put them into the daily life, watching what your child wants to do, then they will calm. They will help your child to regulate. Okay, and then they can. Get a chance to begin to attend and engage. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.